evening, and thank you for joining us for our Black History Month special. I'm Chelsea Monet. Topping things off, an African-American man who spent 23 years in the Air Force tells us the story of how he managed to escape being captured by the German Army. Let's take a look. He's got to know what goes on inside his plane. The heart of his fighter is steel and copper. Its bloodstream is gas and oil. But its brain is the man who flies it. The Tuskegee Airmen certainly proved not only that they had intelligence, but they had bravery and they had skill. You proved to everyone that you were meant to be a pilot, right? Well, I will say so. <laughs> <laughs> Harold Brown flew more than 30 combat missions. Then, in 1945, a special mission. The Tuskegee 99th would destroy an air base in northern Germany and the rail lines and equipment in a 100-mile stretch, heavily traveled by enemy forces. They were successful and ecstatic. I got this one. There's one over here. I just blew up this one. Extremely successful. They turned toward home, but his CO said we missed a big locomotive. And then he broke off, and he says, I'm out of ammunition. I said, well, I got some left. So I went in on this train, blew it up, but just as it blew up, I was passing right over it. The guys were hollering at me, hey, Harold, your aircraft is smoking. The engine quit, and he bailed out. I landed, and I thought, what in the world am I doing up here in Germany? 20 years old, and here I am. Within minutes, he was surrounded by German soldiers. I said, well, I've had it. Threw my hands up in the air like so, and they took me back to this little village. An angry mob had formed because their village took heavy damage from the American bombs. They tried to drag Harold to a tree to hang him. An armed constable saved him from the crowd and took him to another village where days later, other American POWs joined him. He served 23 years in the Air Force, saw it become completely integrated in 1947, and two decades later, when he left the military... Opportunities galore became available. It just completely reversed itself, the way that it should have been all along. Segregation prevented people of different races from gaining an education together. As many African Americans entered new schools, they faced racial comments. Many of these students feeling alone. Let's hear from some of these students who understand what it was like to face racism while working on their education. It was for a cause, and I understood the cause because we talked about it at home. Going to a new school for any child can be overwhelming, but for many African-American students in Franklin County, it was a culture shock. It was a big change in my life, but I had to make an adjustment. It was a drastic change. Um, it was uh, not unpleasant, but some unpleasant things. Most of my issues were just going through the halls between classes. They would uh, push one student into us, and they would say, shoo, shoo. Another issue students faced is that they would never see each other. Usually you were in a class by yourself with all other white students. There were no other black students in your classes. One of the main things that really brought us closer together at Franklin County was the, the uh, few of us that went over there in the first place. During lunchtime, we always assembled together. And pressure of being a black student from Franklin County and a student from the all-black high school, Liam Wade. We didn't want to go over there show out and everything you made it look bad on the rest of the students from Lee Wade. But one powerful memory several students will never forget was Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. Um, a group of uh, white boys said, I'm glad that he's dead, that Martin Luther Coon. And that was, that hurt, that really hurt. The, the day that Dr. Martin Luther King lost his life, you know, that was a, a better moment for me because there were some of the things said in class I didn't approve of. Many years after that, I met this same student, and um, he apologized to me for what he said, you know. 
He said he just didn't know any better back that day. But thanks to the support of their family and others, not every day was so bad. Had a lot of support from the black community. That's how we got through. And there were, there were kind whites. For Glenna Moore, she was the first black varsity cheerleader. They were very kind. In fact, um, when it came time to vote for the most outstanding cheerleader, to my surprise, they named me. And James Jordan helped integrate the football team. You know, three or four of us, we integrated that football field. We, you know, believe it or not, the first year that we played, we went on back that day and we won every game in our district, the Blue Ridge district, except one. Each student had their ups and downs during integration, but would they go through it again? To to pay that price for that short a period of time to be the woman that I came out of that being, I would welcome that again. It's been 57 years since Franklin County Public Schools were desegregated. The lesson they hope the future generation learn is... You have to work together. We've got to make sure that um, we learn from that that we never go back to, to that type of segregation. Funk music artists with ties to Dayton have connections to thousands of songs. We are taking a look at Dayton's influence in the funk music scene as we honor Black History Month. Allison Jens shares why Dayton is considered the home of the funk genre. I'm standing on Stone Street, which was renamed to Land of Funk Way, and this mural behind me is just one of the ways that Dayton honors its proud history of funk music. Dayton, known as the funk capital of the world. Dayton, Ohio leads the country and the world in funk music, and Dayton, Ohio is the most sampled city in America for funk music. The Funk Center founder and CEO David R. Webb says Dayton produced some of the top funk bands in the 70s and 80s. We always say the Ohio players, Slave, Faso, Heat Wave, Lakeside, Steve Arrington, Shirley Murlock, Zap, Roger. It goes on and goes on and goes on. These artists having influence on music outside of the genre and into music today. Gin and Juice uh, from like that uh, uh, stuff. Uh, even uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers did did a remake of Roller Coaster. Uh, so it's so many groups. I can go on. I can go on and on. I don't want to miss nobody, but. It's tremendous, tremendous how Dayton is being sampled. Webb says funk music is an integral part of Dayton's black history, and the Funk Center's mission is to continue to educate people, especially kids, about the significance the music had. We don't want Dayton history to go away. That's very important. We want to keep funk music in Dayton, Ohio, because people all over the world come to Dayton, Ohio, like for the mecca of funk. That's right here in Dayton. To keep that history alive, the Funk Center is currently looking for a permanent building that it can call home. In Dayton, Allison Gens, 2 News, working for you. When we return, it's important to remember the little things that have made an impact on African Americans throughout history. We're taking a trip to Ghana to see how one instrument has made a difference. Stick around. 